The creator is a public policy would serve the population better if they took cognizance of big history, which is not only the human events recorded by historians, but also what science has to tell us about what has happened since the beginning of the human race and the planet Earth. The really big picture is the story of the universe. It all began nearly 13.8 billion years ago in what is called the Big Bang, an explosion of all matter, all space and time itself. That explosion is still in progress today as the universe continues to expand. A bar graph makes a nice timeline to show when important developments occurred. So at one end is the Big Bang, and the other end is today, right now. After the Big Bang, there was a dark age of soupy preatomic plasma before the formation of stars began, then later galaxies, then huge clusters of galaxies. But our solar system and the planet Earth didn't come along until just around four and a half billion years ago. Now, it's difficult for most of us to get our minds around numbers in the billions, so let's map a 12-month calendar onto the history of the universe to get a better perspective on when things happen in the grand scheme. Stars, for example, began forming rather soon, around January 10th in our calendar. And star formation is a process that continues even to this day. But our home, planet Earth, and the solar system didn't form until about September 1st on our calendar. So think about that. Our universe had existed fully two-thirds of its entire history before our planet even came into being. Now let's take Earth history from our graph and expand it into its own full-length bar. Earth started out very hot, like a ball of volcanic lava, and took some 300 million years to cool down. Then, in a lucky fluke of nature, our planet got bombarded by comets and or asteroids for 400 million years, which scientists believe to be the source of all water on Earth. And our luck gets even better. The bombardment stopped just at the right time, before it left too much water on the planet, which would have left us in a permanent water world where perhaps the most intelligent species ever to develop would have been the porpoise. And in fact, the Earth was completely covered in water for some 700 million years. During this time, the first microbial life appeared in the endless ocean, possibly at volcanic vents under the water. That was about 3.7 billion years ago, or September 24th on our calendar. When you think about it, the occurrence of life was remarkably quick after the formation of the planet. Earth was young. Only one-fifth of its existence had transpired, and already life was blooming in its oceans. That's an encouraging point for scientists hoping to find microbial life on other planets today. And it was volcanic action and other Earth forces that eventually caused land to emerge, about October 7th on our calendar. Then, after some three billion years of shifting and morphing around the planet, the land masses ultimately formed the continents that we know today. A development worth noting in the story of Earth is the 300 million year Carboniferous period, when all of the oil, coal, and natural gas were formed as a result of decaying vegetable and animal matter. That hydrocarbon formation does not continue until this day at any meaningful pace, and everything that humans will ever recover was put down there those millions of years ago. Mammals didn't flourish until after the demise of the dinosaurs 65 million years ago, and our early hominid ancestors, the first bipeds, didn't start walking upright on two feet until just six and a half million years ago. That's December 31st in our calendar at just before eight o'clock in the evening. And human beings, our species, Homo sapiens, didn't evolve until 200,000 years ago, or just less than eight minutes before midnight on the last day of our calendar year. That's way too fine a line to show up on our graph, so let's expand the history of humans into its own bar. Now, we were pretty primitive for the first 190,000 of those 200,000 years. We were hunter-gatherers, running around in tribes a lot like chimpanzees. We didn't walk out of Africa until less than three minutes before midnight on December 31st of our calendar. We didn't invent the plow until 42 seconds before midnight. And that burst of human creativity around the turn of the 20th century, when we started to control electricity, invented the light bulb, the radio, the telephone, revolutionized transportation with the automobile and the airplane, created the technologies of television and the battery and the first plastic, 
That didn't happen until one-fifth of a second before midnight at the end of our calendar. So why should our lawmakers take notice of the scientific big picture of history? Well, the preponderance of our lawmakers are lawyers. They comprise the plurality of congresspeople, presidents, and all of our Supreme Court judges. And yet not one law school in the United States requires as a prerequisite for entrance or for graduation that a student has completed just one, only one, science course of any kind. Not Harvard, not Yale, not Stanford, no law school requires any inkling of science whatsoever in its graduates. In consequence, there is phenomenal scientific ignorance in some of our laws and our court decisions. Many lawmakers, not just the lawyers, I'm not beating up on lawyers, many lawmakers seem to believe that laws made by humans can overrule the laws of nature, and they appear not to understand that economic laws are natural laws, just like the laws of physics and chemistry, except that economics is based in biology and psychology, what we need and what we want. Incidentally, the Nobel Prize is given for the science of economics. The Nobel Committee recognizes that it is science, and yet many of our lawmakers are oblivious to this fact. This leads some lawmakers to rush to deem things as our fundamental human rights and claim that every human being is entitled to possess something that was discovered or invented just a fraction of a second ago on our calendar. But nature dictates self-reliance, not entitlement. Forage or hunt with the rest of the tribe and contribute to the communal good or be ostracized and face the wilderness on your own. I urge our policymakers to take a step back and try to see what nature intended for us and pay attention to the imperatives of the evolution of both Earth and humans over these millions of years. Lawmakers can do that only if they have an informed view of the really big picture of history.